Hello, I'm Norm Rasmussen. I want to share with you something that the Holy Spirit has laid on my heart to go on record as taking a, a position about end times. Um, so I'm going to endeavor to be obedient. The title of this message, Why Jesus Christ Won't Return until the Antichrist is first revealed. This is a takeoff of, sort of, the imminent return position of Jesus Christ and or the pre-trib position of the return of Jesus Christ. I'm more comfortable with saying that the imminent return. You have Christian voices out there um, that are saying Christ can come back at any time. At any time. Be ready. Be ready. I don't see that in the Word of God. With the understanding that we need to understand when taking the position of Jesus can return any time. Let's let's just let's go back to to good solid Bible exegeting, <laughs> sound wise Bible interpretation. Fundamental by all the Christian scholars that I esteem, they will tell you there are basically about eight rules of wise Bible interpretation. And I understand why they are wise, because the unwise are used of Satan to bring confusion to Christians trying to get a handle on important matters. And this is an important matter, I believe, that God wants us getting a handle on. When is Jesus Christ going to return for the church, the bride of Christ, Christians who are ready for his return? Um... The eminent return comes from a few quotes in the four Gospels in the New Testament. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. I'm not going to go there. I want to keep this as short as possible. But it basically says, look, Jesus can return any time. Be ready. Be ready. All right? But that's not all that God has told Christians about the return of Jesus Christ. It's not. We need to see what the latest word is that God has for us in the Bible about these matters. We need to be very careful about building doctrines on Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John with excluding other portions of Scripture that were written later, okay? Especially by the Apostle Paul. Here's what the Apostle Paul had to say, and... I can't find anything else in the New Testament Bible that would nullify what the Apostle Paul wrote and the Holy Spirit uh, endorsed, authorized through the Apostle Paul, if you will, on the return of Jesus Christ. I see nothing after this was written. So we're going to go to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, which is the last thing I see written in the Bible about what Christians are to know about the return of Jesus Christ. Did God want us confused about his return? Well, I think he wants us to be ready because our heart can stop beating at any time and our rapture can be at the next stop sign or the next heart attack or however you want to, you know, there's many ways to go out in this life. So our rapture can happen any moment. That's always been the reality of things, okay? And I think that's why it's important in Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John, the eminent return position. Jesus can eminently return for you or I or anybody else down here. None of us have assurance we're going to live another heartbeat. But in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, we have to keep in mind, who was the Apostle Paul writing to? He was writing to the church of Corinth. Okay, and if you read all of Second Thessalonians, you will understand that it's best to go read First Thessalonians and see some of the things that the Holy Spirit wanted them to know and for us to know about 2,000 plus years later. 
But there still seemed to be some issues going on the Apostle Paul felt to address at that time. So he writes a second letter to the church of Thessalonica. And, and God recorded it for us to read and ponder uh, 2,000 years plus later. And I believe this is where God has clearly told the church, the body of Christ, born-again Christians, all they need to know about their, his return back to earth for the church. And, more importantly, how things are going to unfold in the future. I don't know more importantly, but just letting us know timeline of things to come. Let me read out of um, the, new, the King James translation. Most people would think I'm pretty safe by quoting the King James translation, I think. So I'll read out of the King James translation, starting with verse 1 of chapter 2, 2 Thessalonians. Again, he's writing to the church at Thessalonica. He's writing to Christians. Can we agree on that? I hope so. Now we beseech you, brethren... By the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by our gathering together unto him. <laughs> I, to me, it can't be any more plain. This is called what everybody talks about as the rapture. The gathering together with Jesus Christ in the clouds. The scripture says in other places. Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by our gathering together unto him that ye you, you need not be soon shaken in mind, or be troubled, neither by spirit, nor by word, nor by letter as from us, as that day of Christ is at hand. As that the day of Christ is at hand. Critical here. Let no man deceive you by any means. And there's a lot of deception being taught on us. And a lot of young Christians believing must be the way it is because everybody's saying it. They're saying the same thing. It must be true. God is saying, let no one deceive you about the return of Jesus Christ indirectly. For that day shall not come, except there comes a falling away first, and the man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. Let's stop right there a moment. In other translations, accepted, modern accepted translations of the Bible, uh, instead of falling away, it talks about the rebellion, the great rebellion will come, or the, the apostasy will come. They all are saying essentially the same thing, but I think it's important to understand why God would use each word, falling away, the Great Rebellion, the Apostasy. I won't go any further than that, with that right now. In a part two, I think follow up with this message, I'm going to talk about that because I feel it's important to talk about it. Anyway, verse four, let's go back to verse three to, to get the flow. Let no one deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come. What day? The day of Jesus Christ returning for the church, the bride of Christ, the ready, okay? Waiting for him, looking for him. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, except there comes a falling away first, and the man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition, who opposes and exalteth himself above all that is called God, or that is worshipped, so that he as God sits in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God or trying to show himself, make people believe that he's God, is what we need to understand about that. I'm going to read out a New American Standard that reads a little easier. I can't even pronounce King James words anymore. <laughs> uh, New American Standard Translation, Now we request you, brethren, with regard to the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, and our gathering together to him, that you need not be quickly shaken from your composure, or be disturbed either by a spirit or a message or a letter as if it was from us to the effect that the day of the Lord has come. Let no one deceive you. Let no one in any way deceive you. 
For it will not come unless the apostasy comes first, and the man of lawlessness is revealed, the son of destruction, who opposes and exalts himself above every so-called God or object of worship, so that he takes his seat in the temple of God, displaying himself as being God. Those two things must happen. Two things must happen. God has told us clearly before Jesus Christ will return for the church, the body of Christ, whoever that might be at that time. And scholars, Bible scholars that I listen to are looking for a rebuilt third temple in uh, the Jerusalem area somewhere and ultimately a seven-year peace pact is signed by enough governing authorities of the nations to agree that it's okay to build this temple and these are the rules that's going to be adhered to and uh, and then there will come a false peace and a false security to the people, the Jewish people of Israel who's bought into the lie. Now born again Christians, Jewish born again Christians and other born again Christians around the world are going to be screaming ah 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 this is the prophecy that's been predicted for a long time ago and this is the Antichrist. This is not Anything other than the Antichrist Christ is going to show up and in time try to convince everybody he can that he is the true Messiah. He is the true promised Messiah that the Jews look for, for since the beginning of their time and that Jesus Christ was the false Messiah. Now I'm the true Messiah he will be convincing multitudes to. So the born again Christians at that time are going to get persecuted for saying you know, alerting people, no, 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 listen to this guy, he is the devil incarnate. Um, so anyway, let's not get into all of that right now. I'm just simply saying that uh, I believe people who are teaching the imminent return of Jesus Christ, they're in error. Uh, people who are saying that uh, we'll be raptured before the Antichrist is clearly revealed to discerning born-again Christians at that time, whenever that time is, um, they too, you don't want to listen to. And why am I going off on this uh, very controversial topic when I don't even need to, I don't have to? Because I have been called to be a worker of in evangelism. If you go to the other channel we do it's called precious testimonies i do some others as well on youtube but our ministry is primary precious testimonies and god has called us to publish testimonies with presenting the gospel message that's been our primary call for 36 37 years as of this taping i have found the apostasy growing leaps and bounds god could have said growing apathy amongst christians I see Christians motivated less and less for several years now, three, four, five years. Each year is getting worse. Fewer and fewer Christians want to share their born-again testimony publicly. Trust me, I deal with multitudes of them, and they find reason not to. I've got so many Christians who want me to attend Bible studies. And they've been attending Bible studies for 10, 20, 30 years, and they'll be doing it until their last breath. Bible studies. Great! Bible studies are awesome for young converts. But as mature Christians, we're... <laughs> God needs people to help reach the lost, not have one more Bible study. And we are locked to, we, we are just being deceived to this thing called Churchianity. It works so well. Churchianity. Let's go to church. Come to my church. You're not happy in your church? Come to my church. Come to my church concert. Come to my church praise and worship. Come to my church guest speakers. Oh, come to my church. We're going to have a Bible study. That's great for certain people. But eventually, mature Christians who know the Bible, who are very comfortable with the Word of God, they need to be pouring their lives into the lives of others to come to Christ and grow in their relationship with Christ. Quit playing churchianity, in other words. 
that's not a blanket statement for all Christians, but I'll tell you, I see a growing deception in that area. And that's where I think people who have chosen to decide Jesus can come at any moment, they're not concerned about evangelism. They're apathetic about reaching lost souls. They're pretty much apathetic about some good hardcore discipleship, pouring your life into one or more people who need help to grow in their relationship with Jesus Christ until they have reached a state of maturity where they're out duplicating the very same process, soul winning and discipleship. Now some are called more to evangelism like myself than discipleship. I don't have time to sit down with one or more Christians and just pour my life into them. I love doing that and I used to do that but God has said you can't do it all Norm. You're getting older you only have so much ability I want you to pour your life in trying to persuade the unsaved to give their lives to me. So I'm going to leave it there now I'm preaching a little bit but if anybody wants to know and many have asked well what's your position on the end times? Are you pre, mid or post Trev Norm? I think it's a question that's a setup to feed all the division and the confusion into the minds of Christians. It's not important about pre, mid, or post. To me, it's what's important is be about the Father's business. Don't be apathetic about soul winning and or discipleship. Be about what God has called each of us to be doing and when they start laying bricks, mortar, stones, wood, whatever, plastic, synthetics, whatever, they're going to be building a third temple with, uh, and a peace pact of some sort gets signed, probably, okay, then be assured you better be about the Father's business because you haven't got a whole lot of time left. Now, I don't even know if there will be enough liberties by that time to be doing what at least my wife and I have been called to do is publish testimonies on the internet primarily. I, I wouldn't be surprised by that time it'll all be shut down. Part of the Great Rebellion translation is I think those who are adhering to there is a hell that that people will spend eternity in. Anybody who's saying that homosexuality, transgenderism, and practicing relationships out of a God-ordained marriage is sin, they're going to be silenced. They're going to be persecuted and silenced. Various forms of it. And that would include my wife and I, probably, if we're still alive. But that's neither here nor there. God says, today is the only day you have assurance that you have left. So be about what I've called you to do. And that's what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to communicate something. God says in the Second Thessalonians account, don't let anybody deceive you. Now, if it wasn't important for us to get an end time on the return of Jesus Christ, a rough timeline that the Word of God supports, and Second Thessalonians strongly supports the very position I've taken, if there was a better position, <laughs> I think the Holy Spirit would have revealed it to me by now. So, therefore, there's only one position that I can with a level head come to and that Jesus Christ has said he's not going to come back until these two things happen. And uh, so let's be about the Father's business while the doors are open. Um, I know there are some voices out there. Here we are. I'm making this in the middle of July 2018. It'll show that when we upload it onto YouTube. I'm a believer that when Donald Trump gets removed from power, however that happens, you're going to watch all this hatred for Donald Trump and his staff turned toward Christians so that the opposing party will never have to worry about Christians supporting a president ever again. I believe that is Satan's agenda and it's near tops. And if it pans out to be that way, we only have a short while left while President Trump is in power to be about the Father's business openly in America. 
like we have right now as I tape this. Um, I hope I'm wrong. I'm hoping that the passing of President Trump changes nothing and that God holds back and restrains evil yet. However, I do take a position that God is looking at the church to be the biggest restrainer of evil, the Antichrist, gaining inroads. And there is so much apostasy. There is so much twisting of fundamental core Christian doctrinal issues. I mean, I, I get on the internet and some very credible voices. Here I go. I'm going longer, but I'm going to do it. You can shut it off if you don't like it. Credible voices out there with a large influence. Well, yeah, I believe there's a hell, but I believe ultimately, you know, this God of love and mercy and grace will will cause the people who are in hell that are suffering, they won't suffer anymore because a compassionate God wouldn't let them suffer anymore. So they'll just cease to quit suffering or there'll be redemption of some sort for many of them and they'll end up in heaven. It'll all work out and, and we'll all live happily ever after. But this, this eternal hell where people will suffer eternally for their sins, now, I don't believe that. Those voices are growing louder and louder, my friend. That's scary stuff. Because the enemy then understands there's no fear of the consequences for our sin. Uh, Satan is working the homosexuality angle because it's like if we get enough people screaming and shouting, Hey, you know, come on. Lighten up. I'm not hurting anybody who's having a same-sex relationship. Anybody who's having a same-sex sexual relationship is either committing adultery or fornication. Both are sins. If you're a man and you're having a relationships outside of marriage, or if you're single and you're having sexual relationships with somebody, man or woman or snake or dog or whatever, you're committing sin against God. The Bible makes it clearly abundant. That is sin. But we're, you know, we're, we're raging in this battle of homosexuality and you better love me and accept me or it's like, no, I don't accept you if that falls upon you. I'm not going to, I'm going to, I'm not going to tell you it's okay to have sex out of marriage. And God never ordained two men or two women to, to be married. That's never been the Bible. Well, then, I, you know, the Bible's got to be mistranslated or blah, 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 blah. So we pick and choose. We have Christians who demand their right to pick and choose what's valid in the Bible and what isn't. Huh. Take that up with God. Anybody who removes content from these words... They're not going to like the judgment day. Anybody who adds to them, they're not going to like their judgment day. That's paraphrased in the end of Revelation. There is a huge warning from God. You don't mess with my clearly revealed word, clearly accepted translations. I know there's so much deception in this day and age. Christian publishers are producing another version of the Bible. And they're tampering with the authenticity, the, the holy inspiration, breed words of the Holy Spirit through man that has been accepted down through time. Um, man, I'm not, I tell you, I wouldn't want to stand before God and uh, be, have to hold an account and tell God why I mistranslated his word when I thought it was a better translation, when it was nothing more than wanting book sales so we can stay in business as a, quote, Christian publisher. And that's what it's all about. We need to get sales to stay in business. Money, money, money to stay in business. It's sad. But that's all a part of the apostasy, I believe, the great falling away, the great apostasy. All right, I'm into part two of this message, so there may not be a whole lot of part two left. So forgive me for going on and on and on. But I, uh, I just want to end with my friends. Anybody who has ears to hear, 
consider Matthew 6, 19 through 20. Nothing after Matthew 6, 19 through 20 came to refute the words that Jesus spoke. Don't be prioritizing putting your time, your energy, and money into things of this world that have no eternal value. Put your money into treasures that you can be laying up in heaven. There are only one treasure that you can lay up in heaven that God is truly interested in. Truly. All right? That is souls. Lost souls. Lost souls that need to be matured in the Word of God. So they're out doing, replicating, duplicating themselves. Sowing their lives into trying to help somebody come to Jesus Christ and or then grow in their relationship with Jesus Christ with the Word of God being the roadmap and how to do that so that we could have maximized Reception when we stand before Jesus Christ the judge whenever our judgment day would come. So my friend, don't forget that. We can agree to disagree on a lot of things, but one thing Jesus has clearly said, the Holy Spirit has endorsed, so the Father has also endorsed it, all three persons of the Godhead. Pour your life, your time, your money into people. And be wise about who you pour it into. There's a lot of people you can pour your life into that's a bad spiritual investment. Learn how to discern from the Holy Spirit. Have the courage to hear him say, don't waste a lot of time with this person. They're just using you. They're sucking away your time. It's not going to bear a lot of fruit. We need to get more discerning in who we spend our time, our energy, our efforts, our finances, ministries, where we're putting our money, is it good investment, social investment, a bad eternal investment? Just because somebody quotes from the Bible and meets on a street corner church doesn't mean it's a good investment with our money. Okay? So, be wise. Give to good investments. The Holy Spirit will tell you what a good investment is versus a not so good investment. God wants you to have maximized rewards when you enter into eternity. He will determine what that's all about. And, but he says, here's the mindset. Prioritize your life. Pour it into things that I'm into. And Jesus Christ is into lost souls. The cross clearly communicated that truth. Thanks for hearing me out. God bless you.